Multiple studies show that 75% of Christian young people may leave the church altogether after attending public universities. Uh, one of the things that I found um, over the years is that young people just don't have any doctrinal base. Kids grow up in a children's ministry, then they go to youth group, and then we say, go be in the church, and then they don't even really know what to look for. The same studies show one of the key ingredients to maintaining Christian faith commitment through college is personal spiritual investment. The Comenius Institute, where Christian wisdom and college life meet. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Eckel, president of the Comenius Institute. At Comenius, we're really interested in helping Christian young people think Christianly about their studies while they're on the campus of public universities. My focus here is on students, but also on faculty. I want to engage uh, Christian uh, young people to help them to think differently, but I'm also interested in engaging all different kinds of folks, students and faculty, to think about how does their world work in a certain way, and does the Christian message have any, any connection at all in ways that would help them to understand that world. Every couple of days we actually engage students at lunch tables uh, here in Campus Center at IUPUI, and these uh, lunch table conversations can go in so many different directions. My students are engaged in things like engineering, or education, or nursing, or liberal arts. And we have discussions about things that they're learning in their classes, things that their, their professors have said, questions that they have about life in general. And I love, absolutely love, the opportunity to engage young people to think differently about what it is that they're studying from a Christian point of view. here at IUPUI pop up every semester. When I put my feet into a classroom, I don't know where those stories are going to take us or how God will work in that classroom, but I pray for every student that's on my roster before I meet them. I can think of two main stories that I'll summarize quickly, but the first one was a young lady who wanted to present the gospel message according to Romans, a very specific way of sharing the gospel. And in the public sphere, the challenge to do that becomes immense. But I said I would back her free right to speech because the one lesson I wanted all of my students to know, above all, is that they have that right to speak out. No matter what their philosophy is, they have the ability to share who they are and what they are. And that's important that they all have that voice and to discover that voice. Her voice was to share the gospel. And she spoke clearly on that chapter. And her students listened. I love moments like that. I had another one in which a very young believer came up to me and said, I really like to share my faith through this particular topic. And of course, I am open to all voices being heard. And she spoke on that topic and was thrilled that anyone would back her. I've been part of Cominius for three years now. And all of that time, it's been an absolutely amazing experience. Uh, each discussion with Cominius or Dr. Eckel is always so deep, so meaningful, and very relevant to the issues of the day. Many young people today are expressing a need and desire for safe spaces, for psychiatrists and counselors, um, puppies on their college campuses. And uh, these kind of carry some negative connotations. Uh, they, these students are called snowflakes, admittedly by myself and, and others. But when you think about it a bit more deeply, you come to realize that what they're asking for is not completely ridiculous or unrealistic. In fact, um, many Christian students today are in need of something very similar. Uh, we need a place to speak freely about our Christian beliefs, 
uh, coaches and, and mentors to kind of help us navigate through these philosophies and ideologies that we're learning in the classroom and discussing with non-Christian friends. Um, of course, we need the puppies as well. Hi, I'm Brianna, and um, I'm an English education major at IUPY. I'm a Christian, and I have, when I first started coming here, I had a lot of trouble trying to navigate what to do in situations when questions have come up in class, and I didn't know how to respond as a Christian to these questions. And when I found Cominius, it changed everything. Mark is awesome, and he has so many answers that are so great. My name is Luke Haskins. I'm a marketing major uh, here with the Kelly School of Business. You know, I'm, as a marketing major, one thing that has been really, um, I guess, key with, with what we're learning is how do we take something that we see in our everyday lives, whether that be a product, whether that be something um, like an idea or something like that, how do we take that and make it meaningful to other people, and how do we recognize um, value in, um, in, in the everyday things around us. Um, and that's partially actually what Cominius, I think, really helps us to do as well. Um, we go and we recognize the things about school and about our workplace and about the people that we interact with. We take all of these things um, and we're able to use what we have around us. Uh, we're basically able to, to recognize um, how that, that ties into what we believe and how our worldview impacts on those things. When I was a freshman last year, I felt like there weren't many people I could connect to. I kind of felt isolated in my faith. Um, and last year I joined Impact, which is a Christian life group on campus. And even then I had peers that I could grow with, but I didn't really have that like wiser perspective that Dr. Eckel gave in Cominius. And since then that's really helped me to to connect my faith with my schoolwork. Because I didn't see those as things that could connect. I saw them as separate. And even this semester I faced things in my Spanish class where they they talked about Adam and Eve being sexist and I didn't know how to respond so I came to him about it and yeah, it taught me that it's okay to analyze things and to disagree with professors speak up when people say things that just aren't morally right. So my name is Elizabeth and I'm studying philanthropy which is fundraising for nonprofits and I'm interested in a lot of community development, um, economic work within Indianapolis and neighborhoods here. With philanthropy and then community development especially, I've really enjoyed talking to Mark about um, just the biblical idea of what does justice and peace and shalom for a city look like and how that is an idea that can be traced throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Um, and Mark's been a pretty invaluable resource in terms of connecting me with people in the city, uh, shooting me all kinds of readings and articles uh, and just thoughts over what it, what it means to do that. Uh, I think the part of Christian education, particularly in elementary and middle school and high school, that's powerful is I didn't learn algebra in a, from a Christian perspective. Right. I was taught algebra by a Christian life. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I never got it. <laughs> I still don't understand algebra. But I can tell you those, those teachers who had such an impact and I read this in a book recently. They represented Jesus to me. They didn't represent Jesus, they represented Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I saw Christ every day in their lives, and that's what shaped me. The reason that the pilgrims came here in the first place is really because of education. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they want freedom of religion, it's because they want freedom of educating their kids. Mm -hmm. Because when they were in Holland, it was secular government. And so they had religious freedom. They can practice what the, their faith mm -hmm. according to their conscience. But the problem there is that all the kids have to be educated in the government sanctioned school system. Mm -hmm. And they see the problem. They see their kids become more secularized and their kids starting to leave their community. And they saw the danger that 
their community will dissolve as people get older, older people die, as new kids get to the secular schools and they move away from their community. Mm. And that's actually the, the, the reason they, they may take the risk or we come across the Atlantic and settle down in America. And uh, uh, so from the pr uh, Christian perspective, education is always the center how to educate our next generation to become a young man, young woman. And so I go off to, to state school. I was planning on going to a Christian college and I blew out my knee and had to stay home and God knew what I was doing. I met my beautiful wife there. But I'm at Wright State University in my first class and I take a Western religions class. And every day I argued, it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, and we would argue the whole class. It was me and 30 students, and it was me versus the professor, because he said things I had never heard. Yeah. And he, he challenged the, the foundation of my belief. And uh, thankfully, since I was at home, I would go meet with my pastor or, or with my parents, and they would help walk me through these things. And, and so, you know, my life's being challenged. And on the last day of class, the professor says, uh, Mr. Height, could you come to my office? And everyone thought, you're toast. <laughs> and I did too. And, and I got there and he, uh, it's such a long time ago, he had a thing called a typewriter. And so he's, <laughs> he's typing away and he stops. He never looks at me and he says, Mr. Height, you know what you believe, but you don't know why you believe it. It would serve you well to learn that. You're dismissed. And, and so, I think God took me on a path of learning. Thankfully, I was able to not um, just have my faith questioned, but to, to uh, allow me to then have folks who helped me work through that. And I think that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Comenius is that we help students to think about what they're taking right now in their college courses. Um, I've had students in engineering, I've had students in humanities, um, other students in the tech programs really doesn't matter whatever it is that they're studying I'm just always interested in what they're studying and the kinds of classes they're taking and when we start talking about the classes what ends up happening is uh, they tell me you know I've heard this or I've seen that or I'll start asking them questions almost makes me tear up when I think about it. I have seen students who have stepped forward in the classroom, who have unveiled their faith in front of their peers and paid consequences for it. But I've also seen the wonderful blessings of them understanding how to communicate that faith in the classroom or interpersonally with students and their peers and make a difference. And that's what has happened. That's where all of these concepts that Comenius teaches you, helps you engage. So in my argument at writing class, actually, I decided to write about the reliability of the New Testament Gospels. And I needed resources for this paper because I didn't know where to start. So I went to Mark, who's the leader of Comenius, and he helped me immensely. He sent me all these resources, and it really helped. And I was able to write a paper that my professor loved, and I got to share with other classmates, and it was a great opportunity for me to show people that you can trust the Bible and that this thing has evidence for it being trustworthy. So. In one class I took, it was called Psychology of Giving, and it was all about why are people, uh, like what motivates them to give money. It's kind of counter-evolutionary, like you wouldn't really think about helping somebody else at a detriment to yourself. And so we kind of talked about just the idea of how empathy in human beings, which is such a counter-evolutionary idea, really points to the evidence that we live designed intentionally and designed to do that. So it was fun after we had that conversation in class where my teacher was like, we don't really know why that humans show empathy. They have all of these theories about how to make that work and how, them, how they can make sense of it. Um, just being able to talk to Mark about how that's actually something super helpful and um, yeah, really cool.
one very interesting example was there was uh, a paper or a, a, an article that we were supposed to read for class and it really had to do with where um, conservatism and liberalism came from as far as um, worldview basically and it had to do something with conservatism being based around um, one kind of section of Christianity and liberalism being based on another section of Christianity and how those conflicted with one of them based on the Old Testament one of them based on the New Testament that sort of thing. And Mark, uh, we, we sat down and talked about it. And I remember he got his eyes got really big as he saw the paper. And we, we started talking a little bit about it. And we recognized the fact that that uh, you know there were certain things that we agreed with, certain things that we disagreed with. But we got to sit down and, and argue and ask questions to say, okay, what does Scripture really say about what we're learning here? What is our article? Is this is this article based on fact? Is it um, based on what? What are the underlying assumptions? Where does it, its authority come from? That's what I think. So I think. Um, Authority um, and then the assumptions that we make are, are two of the pillars around which Mark really likes to, to unpack the things. Yeah. We talked a lot about my research right now works with kind of machine learning, data science type stuff. So we talked a lot about the implications of that, the sort of technology, ethical responsibility, and it's, it's been a lot of unanswered questions in the field in general. And so talking those, or at least playing out scenarios with Mark is really important. I guess it definitely challenges me to um, keep my eyes open to and my ears open to what I'm learning in the classroom versus what the actual truth is and what the scripture says. Christian students today, dare I say, are, are, are discriminated against um, on most secular college campuses. Um, most every idea is well tolerated except for Christianity. And so now we've reached the point where Christianity, Christian ideals, to bring those up in class, it really, it really takes some guts. Um, also faced by professors, employers asking us to sign documents that are asking us to uh, ally ourselves with people in, in sinful practice. Um, we're also surrounded by people who wish to take advantage of our, our youth and intellectual vulnerability um, and impose their views on us. Um, and it seems like they're succeeding. Unfortunately, when you, when you see the statistics are 70% of students going into college identifying as Christians, leaving the faith after one year on campus. Uh, it's with Cominius that I've experienced the sort of care and concern for my spiritual well-being as a college student that I know I need. Um, Cominius is like a pocket of light on the IUPUI campus where I can come and join Christian discussions likely not happening anywhere else on campus. It's where I can look for godly wisdom and advice from Dr. Eckel and my colleagues there every week on even the most mundane of issues but that matter to me or, or on the bigger issues. And um, it's a place where Christians are built up in their faith as we live in this interesting environment and at an admittedly vulnerable time in our lives. Um, Cominius really addresses the challenges of academic life combined with a life of following Christ in a way that's unique and hugely beneficial to college students. I think a lot of other campus ministries at IUPUI focus a lot on evangelism and kind of community, which are really important aspects, but Mark's the only person I've found that kind of intersects both you know, what you're doing as a student, which is really important, and then your faith, which is obviously the most important thing. So it's been really valuable. Johnny Miscominius was the 17th century Moravian pastor uh, who actually believed that women should be educated. Not only that, but he believed that everybody should be educated on the basis of how they learn best. So he was really concerned about individual methods of teaching. That was really countercultural in his day. Aside from that, he was countercultural in this way as well. He believed in something called pansophy. Pansophy means wisdom throughout the earth. And so when he talked about this, he was talking about what we consider today to be the encyclopedia. And he saw wisdom of God everywhere as he was uh, traveling, as he uh, taught. Uh, he was always looking for God.
God's footprint. And it's always there, Colossians 1 tells us, by Him, by Jesus, are all things held together. This is what communion has taught, this is what I believe, this is how uh, He began the process of thinking Christianly in His own day and time. But we named the Cominius Institute after John Amos Cominius for that very reason, because education is what we are all about. We're concerned about the next generation of Christian young people. We're concerned that we meet people where they're at individually with the things that they're interested in, in this particular case, with the academic disciplines in which they're invested and the kinds of classes that they're taking right now. So I have students constantly interacting with me about one thing or another, but these issues are issues that are their vocation right now. Their vocation is to be a student. My responsibility is to help them through that process, thinking Christianly about all things. That's what John Amos Cominius did, and that's what the Cominius Institute does on the campus of that. At Cominius, we cross three bridges. The first bridge is into college. The second bridge that we cross is into communities. Our community emphasis is through our radio show, Wardman Woof Radio, that appears every Wednesday from 10 until noon. And we have all different kinds of guests, Christians from around Indianapolis, who are doing good. The tagline from our, for our show is Titus 3, 1, 8, and 14, to do good, do good, do good. And so we're interested in Christians doing good, who are doing good, all around Indianapolis. On uh, the Comedians Institute uh, radio show, Dr. Mark has been um, really reaching out and penetrating an audience to try to get number one people to understand um, the, the division of color uh, is not that great. I think we make a lot out of uh, race and race relations. Mark has um, gone out uh, with, a, with a sincere mission to say we have to break the divide and we have to know one another if we want to work together. Uh, so his show was designed that way, and as the owner of Radio Next TV, uh, my my position is more than anything to help amplify uh, his message and his vision. We are here today for the Comenius Institute to discuss uh, very important ideas uh, with very important people here in Indianapolis, and we're really pleased today to have with us uh, Merlin Gonzalez, who is in charge of a very important nonprofit here in Indianapolis called Faith, Hope, and Love. Merlin, thanks so much for being here with us today. We're grateful for your time. I'm happy to be here. Mark. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, generally speaking, from your vantage point, why you think uh, something like uh, the Cominius Institute needs to exist in Indianapolis and what benefit it might have for the culture here in town? I think the Cominius uh, fills the gap. Uh, of course, there are other organizations out there that are helping to collaborate and to connect uh, different ministries, but I think the Cominius has a, a different uh, place that fills in the gap. And one of that is uh, through your radio station, that through that, not only we reach the people in Indianapolis and maybe outside Indianapolis because of the power of the um, media that you bring to Indianapolis. One of the things that we find over and over again, uh, honestly, weekly, uh, we find this to be true, is that all of the different folks that are in and around the radio show uh, seem to be introduced to other people that they've never heard of or known before. And the importance of that, I think, is kind of obvious. From your vantage point, what has been the benefit for you in your nonprofit world uh, to have been involved and invested in the radio show, specifically at Warp and Move? Well, one example is that connecting with, as you mentioned, with other leaders in, uh, in Indianapolis. For me, um, when I went there, I get to meet uh, Dr. Closely, uh, Pastor Closely, and eventually got to meet his wife and visit Antioch Missionary Baptist, which is not too far from our office. Mm -hmm. And I think that without Comenius and without you, uh, we may connect some sometime in the future, but because of that, we got connected and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work together, mm -hmm. collaboration, networking, partnership for the betterment of the community. One of the things that I know is true about your work with Dr. Posley is that Faith, Hope, and Love is going to help this church, Antioch Baptist, uh, toward the goal of the food pantry idea that you have instituted here in Indianapolis. Tell us a little bit about that connection for Antioch, for Dr. Posley, and then maybe fill us in on the general understanding of, for our audience 
about what it is that Faith, Hope, and Love hopes to do here in Indianapolis. Faith, Hope, and Love is an organization that incubates and uh, teaches food pantries to be more mission, meaning beyond the transactions of, of exchange so of food when people come we want to maximize that uh, that means in order for us to identify other social fields that may contribute to hunger so regarding this particular area here this is one of the food desert area so we are still in the planning stage how we're going to work together with Antioch missionary Baptist here in Indianapolis and I'm hoping that whether we work directly or indirectly, that we will be able to bring uh, the, uh, the issue that food is not the sole answer to hunger. Mm -hmm. And as you know, again, food could be just a symptom of many social ills. And I believe we're missing a lot of opportunities in identifying the, those social ills by just being busy counting the numbers of people that we give food and counting the number of pounds that we give away rather than the outcome, which is change lives. And so uh, with him doing this weekly show, um, the guests have just been incredible as he makes sure that uh, that divide and that line is drawn closer and closer, understanding that we serve the same God, uh, we eat the same food, <laughs> we, we, we have the same emotional uh, uh, outcomes a lot of times and we, we make one little ignorant thing called race be in the way of just a good harmonious relationships in our community so uh, I applaud him for doing this work and uh, it's, it's thankless and it's not easy and sometimes it's misunderstood he and I uh, uh, we have a kindred spirit we, we, we call each other twins you know because his mom is my mom I met her and just fell in love but in truth we're able to talk and explain some things that might be a bit harsh for most people. Uh, we can get down to the bare bones of what is this thing called race? What happens in our community, in our culture, uh, that makes it misunderstood a lot of times to other cultures? So we go real deep into critical thinking uh, of that problem. So uh, I just like to say, man, I love this guy, and uh, his mission is helping our community just be better. So. Um, that's what uh, he does with Comenius. And Mark and I took that relationship and the first day I interviewed him, I told him, you have a gift for this. And I think you need to probably seek doing this. And within 10 days, he had a show and we had to look back. Uh, the greatest shows that we have ever had is when he's brought some of the students in from IUPUI and just to listen to how bright and in-depth these young people are uh, by number one, having an opportunity to be mentored by Mark. Um, I witness it every day as well. I have some young people, and this is the first year some of my young people actually graduated from high school and on their way to college. And to watch what you invest into grow, uh, there's nothing greater. So when you get to hear the kids when they come in, these students who Mark has had the opportunity of uh, uh, facilitating information through Comenius, uh, the respect that they have for them, some of the bridges that you see when they were having some struggles and troubles, but having that program there help get them through it when they might have been confused. When you think about doing good in the community as, as a whole, I know what you do here at Shepherd. I get the general understanding and overlay. I, I've been through your facility. I've talked with people. We're going to have some of you on the radio show soon. Um, why is that such an important issue for the church? Why is it that, that the church should demonstrate, should do? Why is that? It's a natural outpouring of our holiness. If we believe in the day of Pentecost, so we go back to the Tower of Babel and community and the life as it was was broken. Mm -hmm. And so the story doesn't end there. But God comes in a healing way to, to Jesus who restored our relationship with him. And then the Holy Spirit who then begins to put us back mm -hmm. and connect us. I, I talk about how in our uh, churches, we have a communion table, and it says, in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. And I said, so the opposite of remember, what if it was dismember? <laughs> and that the very act of Christ's death on the mm -hmm. cross is the greatest Humpty Dumpty story you'll ever hear. Mm -hmm. He puts us back together. He remembers us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that we are... 
seeing uh, the, than the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we saw in Pentecost in the story of Acts. It was, uh, it was just who they were. It wasn't a program. You know, I'll, I'll go to a church and they'll say, well, we have a budget line for compassion. I go, do you have a budget line for prayer? Do you have a budget line <laughs> for these other things? It's just who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're not giving out, then we're creating no room for Christ to continue to infill us. I do think it's important. It's one of the reasons why at Shepherd Community, we try to bring college students in to see faith, to see justice. I refer to it as biblical justice. It's being laid out in a way that's meaningful. We see in Christ, in the compassionate life he lived, he did two things was part of every miracle. He gave glory to the Father, but he connected to people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a drive-by mm -hmm. uh, compassion. And we know Jesus didn't heal everyone, and those he healed died. So there was a higher purpose than the, the temporary healing. You know, Lazarus is this two-time loser who he dies, raised from the dead, and we know later he dies again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I want to help students, Shepherd wants to help students explore this idea of biblical justice and what does it mean and what mm -hmm. does compassion look like, not defined by the world. I've got plenty of folks who want to tell me what it is to, to be a Christian and how to love, mm -hmm. um, which generally is defined by them as giving, me, giving them what they want. As a parent, we, we learn that with our kids, and, and as someone who's lived in this community with my family for 23 years, I've learned God has a much different way to define it. Mm. Matter of fact, what I think is, in Genesis, we know it says God created everything and it was good. Then Satan perverts it, Genesis 3. And uh, I think the perversion, you know, it became life, became death, health became sickness. And I would say compassion became feeling sorry for. Mm -hmm. And there's too many Christians who live in this perverted way of, of thinking that I just need to feel sorry for someone. So I'll do a drive-by, I'll drop a dollar in their thing, and I've done something. And I don't see Christ doing that. He was purposeful in it. Mm -hmm. And then the third bridge that we cross into is into culture helping Christians, generally speaking, helping them to understand how to think about their culture from a Christian point of view. So for instance, the last book that I wrote was on movies, when the lights go down. And what I'm interested in in that book, for instance, is helping people to think about how do I think about film? How do I think about movies as I'm actually watching them? How do I teach my young people? Uh, how do I teach my children about how to watch movies? How do I think about this within my church to help uh, Christians to think differently about this. So we engage all different kinds of areas of culture and are very concerned that Christians think differently than everybody else. This is especially important as we think about the future of the church. When I think about the future of the church, I'm very concerned about what the psalmist said, that we actually, who are gray heads, those of us who are old and gray, are actually giving ourselves to continue to describe the mighty works of God to the next generation. And those mighty works are coming all the way through every aspect of God's creation. Everything from astronomy to zoology. We're interested in everything from a Christian point of view because this is God's world and he made it. And so because of that, we're concerned then that we think differently with our students. So these personal conversations, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes small group and myself included in this uh, in gathering, uh, then actually gives students uh, an opportunity to think in ways that perhaps they haven't been taught how to think in the past. Right. In the Church of the Nazarene, which my ordination is through, 88% of the kids go to state schools. And so the church has to understand it's not just preparation, but how do we stay engaged? Right. And when you have those questions in biology class in college, or you, you know, in one case in a political philosophy class, I had a professor who mocked me and and would would just say rude things to me in class in front of everyone because of my faith and I didn't understand what I was doing and I probably didn't help myself at times mm -hmm. with things I would do um, I probably a little too brash I, I tend to to associate with Peter very well <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with Cominius is committed to the idea that 
we do not leave our students after they leave us uh, at the end of high school, that we take them beyond youth group, and that we are concerned about them all the way through their college years. And that means having personal connection with them. One of the things that we know in all of the stats that we're confronted with in the church generally is that 75% of Christian young people will leave the church altogether after attending public university. That's a very troubling statistic. But one of the things that we know that will overcome that stat is that we spend personal, engaged time with Christian young people on the campus. We are here today with Nate Gass from Life Point Church down here on the south side of Indianapolis. We're talking about the importance of college ministries. Uh, Nate, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Appreciate it. Happy to yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you and your church do to encourage uh, Christian young people during their time at university. Well, one of the we began to notice about ten years ago when I started here that there just weren't any bridges, you know. So kids grow up in a children's ministry, and then they go to youth group, and then we say, "Go be in the church," and, and they don't even really know what to look for. There's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no pizza parties at the church, there's no video games at the church, and, and so they don't really know what to look for. They never really experience the theology of the sacraments, and, and have no concept of, of really biblical worship, preaching of the word, mm -hmm. um, and so we. We really just wanted to bridge gaps. We wanted to, um, to to find ways to keep them connected, to plug them in, use their spiritual gifts, to, um, to to encourage them. And so we found we need to we need to just maintain connections with them, keep them tethered. And then once they were tethered, they built those habits. So, so we try to really you can't do it all. So we try to do a couple of things really well. And um, you know I think uh, the significance of community. Um, and so. We meet in the basement of my house, and there's cookies coming out of the oven, and I got four daughters that are jumping on their heads and challenging <laughs> the four square games, and um, and so I think there's a kind of an authenticity. If I moved it to the church, I'd lose half my people. Okay. They just wouldn't come. It would be viewed as an institution. It would be viewed as a program, yes. which really is their whole life. You know, there's been a generational shift. You and I played played football, but we just played in the backyard, the neighborhoods, the kids mm -hmm. came. And you solved your own conflicts, and you had to call your own penalties, and, and now everything's super high. So the parents, everything's AAU, everything has an official, everything has parental oversight, um, and so the, their whole world is institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we kind of take the institution out, and we say, look, this is just what the church looks like in 90% of the world. We sit in a basement, we, we walk through the scriptures, we pray together, uh, we encourage one another, we, we break bread. There's a simplicity to it. Mm -hmm. And, and so we try to build on that sense of community first and foremost. The second thing is um, really just integrating them in the scriptures. We, we, there's a ton of good books out there. Mm -hmm. We just kind of, for the most part, stay walking through the Word, which is a way to teach hermeneutics, which is a way to, to, to tie in history, which is a way to tie in a million things. But we group things there. We do a lot of scripture memory. Um, just kind of going back to some of the old disciplines, and again, just training habits and what they treasure and value. So when you think about um, college students, college ministry, and you think about the need for this interdisciplinarity, um, talk about some of the ideas that you've been able to communicate this way. I know that you've had a, a real vast background in terms of Christian ed. You've had uh, engagement in the humanities and the sciences in lots of different ways. How do you give example to young people, to students that you're working with, to say, here's what scripture teaches and here's how it looks? In the world around us, yeah, I think one of the one of the faults that the church has done is kind of a sit from the pulpit and, and let me just tell you. Yes. And, and this is I, this may be too cliche, I don't know, but when you see Christ's model of discipleship, it was usually let's just walk. Yeah. Let, let, let me just show these things to you. And so we've really just tried to, to kind of integrate so many of these. Yeah, I say kids is that an insult? I mean, no, that's okay. all. Too many of these students <laughs> um, kind of into our into our families, mm -hmm. and so. Rather than just having them over on Wednesday night, which is the kind of core of what we do, but a lot of it's, you know, I got a, I got a secondary job out of the farm or in the chop wood, you know, much gone. And, uh, and let's just, let's just talk, you know, what's going on? I mean, their lives are so disconnected. I mean, and, 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 and we know this, but there's this segment, this compartmentalization. And so if we can just get them to see the holistic element of life, and, and I know it's a phrase you've used before, you know, the phrase used to be biblical integration. I think you need, I've got pretty used to phrase biblical permeation. How do we get into permeate? It's not separate. It should seep into. So for us in the church, I think it's imperative for us to uh, come alongside those folks 
Uh, they help them to think uh, differently about what they're engaged with uh, on a regular basis in college. Uh, and to, to show them that you actually care about them, to have, you, have them in their homes, uh, to be engaged with them in the church, uh, to help them to know that all the way through college years, uh, the church really continues to, to uh, give itself to those young people. We're very excited about the future at Comenius. One of the things in our planning for what is next is actually to hire an executive director. And what I'm really envisioning for this particular position is a younger African-American man who will come in and walk alongside me as soon as he's hired. And that this person would then become uh, the person who would take Cominius into the future. And here's the reason why. I understand that the world doesn't look like me, and I understand that the world is important to look like all of us. When we think about working in the city, when I think about working in a university which is in a city, IUPUI, in Indianapolis, I think it's really powerful for us to commit ourselves to helping uh, the future of Cominius look more like uh, what the world is going to look like, certainly what the, the church in the world looks like in Revelation chapters 5, 7, and 9. And so that's one of the great plans for our future, is that we want somebody else to walk alongside me who then becomes the future of Cominius himself. So some of you who have been watching this documentary might be asking yourself, how can I become involved? That's a great question. We at Cominius would be really interested in your engagement with us. We need partners who are interested in not only telling others about what Cominius does, but becoming involved yourself. For instance, it would be really great if you would come and spend time with young people on the college campus itself. Sometimes what we need is money, and sometimes we talk about uh, Cominius patrons. And so when we talk about patronage, we think about how can you invest your future capital in a place like Cominius? Do you care about the future of the church? And young people in particular for the next generation, do you care about those who are interested and involved in education, in higher education? Well, then you might want to invest those monies in something like Cominius. We would love to have you pray with us about the future, about things that you can do to help us. We are also interested, however, in you praying for us, praying for the kind of strength that we need to do all of the work that we do all of the writing and the speaking and the teaching and engaging in relational conversations with people around campus. That would be a tremendous help to us. For everybody here at the Cominius Institute, I'm Dr. Mark Eckel, president of the Cominius Institute. Grateful for your time and the opportunity that you've taken to watch this documentary. Looking forward to the future to see how wisdom, Christian wisdom, and life connect. <laughs> yep, there's the Crocs. <laughs> I mean, he always makes me, he always laughs at me for things that I say, and I'm like, was that actually funny? Like, I, I, I never knew, <laughs> I, I don't always intend it that way, but he sees the, the brilliance, the funniness, and the things that we say, which is what makes him so easy to get along with and converse with, because like, he talks to us at our level, which is really nice. Dude, Mark is the coolest guy ever, and he is like super smart. He knows so much about what to do when you are in this environment and you don't know what to say because you're surrounded by unbelievers and you just need some advice. Like, what do I say in this situation? You gotta come to one of these meetings because you're gonna be confident in your ability to respond.